Oh, good morning, folks. Uh, Bobo's here. Welcome back to 3Zen. This morning, I want to talk with you a little bit about the uh, T-38 accident rate since we began flying the aircraft in 1960, at least flying it operationally. And specifically, as related to stalls and sink rates in the traffic pattern. So, in 1985, we had a risk assessment conference down at uh, Randolph for the Chiefs of Stand of Val throughout the command. It was a day and a half conference, it began at 1 o'clock on day one and went through 5 o'clock on day two, I guess. I don't know. At any rate, when everybody mustered to the conference room and the grip and grin session was over, we got down to business. And what they did, they. Uh, had a couple blackboards up there and they put up there the most high risk maneuvers that we were uh, conducting in respective aircraft, the T-37 and T-38 at the time. So when they got to the T-38, one of the, I think it was the first thing that came up was uh, stalls and or sink rates in the final turn were considered high risk items. Well, isn't that interesting? So. They went through a bunch of other things, but I kind of got hung up on that a little bit. Now, in the T-37 side of the house, they used to have a problem uh, with spins in the aircraft. And so what they did, they took a ride in the T-37 uh, syllabus, and it was a non-graded ride, wherein the instructor, student would go out and they fly spins of all sorts, of all flavors, if you will. And that essentially resolved the problems they were having with uh, spins in a low altitude environment. Um, made sense to me. And so I've always wondered, wonder why we haven't had a stall sink rate ride specifically oriented to showing uh, our young IPs the, um, the cracks they can get themselves into with respect to a, a stall or a sink rate high sink rate in the final turn. So that was kind of the start of my thought process. Well, after the conference was over, I walked over, I went over to, I didn't walk, hell, it's halfway across the damn base. I drove over to uh, headquarters ATC safety and uh, contacted Jim Borden. Now Jim was a civilian and he was one of those kind of guys, he just knew everything about T-37, T-38 accident. He was a former um, P-51 pilot in World War II, and he was just a wealth of knowledge when it came to uh, statistics and every little thing you need, you wanted to know about uh, these accidents. So anyway, I asked him, I said, hey Jim, I'm kind of curious about our T-38 stall sink rate experience in the final turn um, from the time we began flying these airplanes. I said, would you have any uh, st statistics on those? And he said, well, not offhand, but he says, give me a couple days. And he says, I probably can come up with something for you. Well, true to form, about uh, two days later, I get a call from Jim and he uh, says, hey, I think I have everything you're looking for. So I drove over, he gave me a cup of coffee and I sat down and uh, what he had done, he pulled out any accident related to a stall or a sink rate in the final turn or on final approach from 1960 through 1985 through the present. The last one we had was uh, I think in January, February up at Shepherd, uh, where a young lieutenant IP and his student were killed in the final turn. So it was fairly recent. Anyway, I sat down and looked at the pile and what we had was um, 42 aircraft destroyed with 39 pilots killed. All right, wow. So with that recent one, just so fresh, if you will, I thought to myself, now, wait a minute, this has to be a teaching issue because if we were teaching uh, stalls and sink rates and the recoveries, um, we wouldn't have this continuing on like this, or you wouldn't think we would. So. I took these accidents and it took me a few days to sort them out, lay everything out and kind of go through them. 
I was curious about what kind of pattern they were flying. Oh, they fly in uh, normal overhead, 60% flaps, uh, no flaps. Were they too wide? Were they too close? What were the winds? Uh, what were the environmentals, the visibility, and so forth? So I started pulling these things out, and then I took a look at the straight ends, same type of thing. And the straight ends, I added a uh, single engine, where they fly in single, simulated single engine approaches or what. So I just, it took a while, but I began to pull this out, and then I took this data that I extracted and I put it into a matrix. And it was fascinating because in every case, there was one common denominator. And that was the throttles in each case were, had been retarded to idle before, either before they hit the ground um, or just before they hit the ground, they may have taken them and slammed them up uh, into max AB, but the point was moot at that point. The throttles were at, at idle as they began the maneuver, and that's what induced the sink rate. Uh, when you think about it for a moment, if, the, uh, if you're flying on a uh, normal approach, what we would do is, on a normal approach with, um, you know, winds, whatever, 45 degrees of bank, come around um, and then uh, we show them a sight picture and you just came around 45 degrees of bank, rolled out and final came in and landed. If you're too wide, what you do is you're too wide, you don't necessarily go into that 45 degrees of bank, you leave a shallower bank, but if, with a shallower bank, if your power is up, you're not going to get down. So what they do is they pull the power back to idle or near idle and that induces a sink rate that's awfully hard to detect. And then the same thing if you're too close. If you're too close, now you got to really honk this thing around so you, you go to your 45, but again, you bring your power to idle, but you're really pulling like crazy to get the thing down. And you might tap a, a bottom rudder at the time, same time, but the point is you induce a sink rate. And it held true both for uh, normals and no flaps. And then uh, you run into similar situations on straight ends. So, I took that picture, that snapshot I had, and I said, okay, how would we, how would we teach it different? Well, one of the things that I did at the time, now this cracked me up, uh, I asked Jim, I said, do you have the training manual for the T-33 that uh, was used before the T-38? And he says, yeah. So he walked back and pulled that out for me. I think if I asked him if he had training manual for the Jenny, he could he could have pulled it out. But anyway, so he pulls it out, and I thumbed through there, and I found the section on um, stalls recovery from stalls and uh, sink rates in the T thirty three, which was a straight wing airplane. And then I I had, I knew what what it was in fifty one thirty eight, which was our uh, governing directory for T thirty eight training. I'll be damned, it was the same thing. All those morons had done is they took that paragraph on recovery from stall and sink rate in the traffic pattern, they cut it out and put it in the T-38. Well, the T-38 with its swept wing, a high degree of, of sweep, the stall characteristics are totally different than they are from um, the T-33. So that was the first thing that I discovered uh, as I continued forward. The other thing is the T-38 discussion on sink rates was... Um, something to the effect that sink rates are very dangerous. If you get into them, they, you can get hurt. So don't get into them. Brilliant. Anyway, so from there, I collared a few of uh, the guys I uh, really had respect for with respect to uh, flying the 38, all of them high time 38 guys, uh, Byron Allen, Rick Lanier, Bill Fair, a couple others. And I sat down with them and I said, hey, this is an idea I have. I want to create a ride non-graded, where we take a kid, stick them in the airplane, and take them out and show them how to fly the 38, and show them the perils, where he can get in trouble with it. Uh, what do you think of that? And he says, well, great idea. And I explained to him why. I, I talked a little bit about our accident rate uh, to date, and they were, they were as astonished as I was. So it took about, uh, oh, better part of three months, four months, to put a ride together, and uh, the ride encompassed a uh, briefing that was a little bit more specific than our normal briefings because we had a specific purpose in this. And uh, it, in, 
included, um, oh, I've got to hear this standby here. I wanted to talk to them about um, the onset of the different buffets. Yeah, here we go. And uh, the recovery, subsequent recovery. So in the briefing, I have never been a proponent of talking about different critters running across the wings, as people are apt to do during um, stall training. They talk about hamsters going across a wing. That's um, high frequency, low intensity buffet. Then they talk about uh, dogs or squirrels or cats going across a wing. Then elephants going across a wing. Oh, Jesus Christ, I'm out here to teach you how to fly, not walk you through the zoo. So the first thing is uh, high frequency, low intensity, if you will. It just, it's like a buzz on the wing. And then as you continue toward the stall, you get a uh, high frequency, moderate intensity. The intensity uh, begins to uh, increase. And then as the stall progresses, it goes from here into a, uh, a moderate um, frequency, moderate intensity. It starts to really start to bang on you like that. And that's when you know, that's where we recover from. So we talk about that a little bit in the briefing. And then we talk about the uh, different scenarios that we're going to put the aircraft in, take a look at uh, the intensity on the wing, if you will, and cross-check that with the... Um, uh, VVI, the vertical velocity in indicator, and also I bring in, introduce the AOA into this, the angle of attack indicator. And then we had this nifty little checklist that I, uh, that we created. Um, it's for the, we gave a copy to the student and to the instructor, and they go through all these uh, uh, baseline parameters, uh, talk about inadequate displacement from the runway, too wide, too tight, and invert no flap. So what you do is you put in your normal uh, final turn, final approach airspeeds and start around the corner, but you forget to put the flaps down. And then we talked about generating a high sink rate and so forth. Uh, slow airspeed, on speed, AOA entry, uh, and so forth. We really explored the different uh, ways you could get yourself into trouble with sink rates. So put this ride together, came very, very happy with it. Um, and then send it up to command to formalize it into the uh, T-38 PIT syllabus. Well, the first thing they wanted to do was to reject it. Uh, it, was, it was just so tough to get through the parochialism at headquarters. But one thing they could not argue with was the fact that if we were teaching this adequately, why were we still killing people? They couldn't, they couldn't come up with an answer for that. So... It took about 18, 15 months or 18 months for that to work its way through command before it became institutionalized. And, uh, oh, I'm thinking mid-1987, it became approved and we started flying it as a, a ride at T-38 uh, PIT. From there, the ride was, uh, it, we had a lot of success with that ride. Uh, like I said, it was non-graded and I really wanted to do that because I just, I love instructing, and I wanted to have a ride where you take a student and say, hey, here's your grade sheet, it's non-graded, okay, we're just going to go out, get in the airplane, we're going to go out, and I'm going to teach you something, we're going to have some fun with it. And that was kind of the idea behind the whole uh, project. So um, the ride became institutionalized, and um, one of the first bits of feedback I got was from a uh, fellow, Lieutenant Browning, Lieutenant Browning was a, a loose cannon when he came through PIT. Um, I could go more into it, but I'm not going to. Uh, anyway, he came to PIT, and I think that's the first time he discovered that uh, there was no adult supervision. Uh, he was getting a paycheck, and he didn't have hair on his crotch, and he was just a kid on fire. Anyway, very immature. Uh, we had to have a couple come to Jesus meetings, but he got himself sorted out and he actually did pretty well um, last I saw him. But anyway, we were down in the Augur Inn one night, or I was down there, and I ran into Lieutenant Brown. And he came up and he said, you have a second? I said, well, sure I do. What's up? He says, sir, he said, you saved my ass. I said, pardon me? And he said, well, about three weeks ago, 
he said uh, the student got slow in the final turn and I began seeing some of those things you showed me out in the area down here at Randolph and holy crap he said just like we saw in that um, out in the area it was just it was just happening one thing after another he said I took the airplane lit the burns went around and uh, I'm here to tell you about it today that's what makes that ride totally worth it and another thing that makes that uh, ride kind of um, interesting to me is since its inception back in 97 until about two years ago the command had experienced zero uh, T-38 accidents attributed to stalls and sink rates uh, either in the final turn or on final approach. About two years ago, maybe three years ago, I, I can't be sure, they had a young uh, lieutenant uh, killed uh, uh, in the southeast part of the United States doing a circling approach. I think he was in over his head. I think the weather was bad. I think he got forced into flying that day, that afternoon, they're behind the, the, the uh, timeline and just a bunch of other things. And I think he lost, they were doing a circling approach. The weather was coming down on him, and I think he lost situational awareness and just forgot everything else. It's unfortunate. Um, but that being said, when you look at the experience for the first 25 years, 42 airplanes destroyed 39 people killed. And then the next 35 years, one airplane destroyed two people killed. And that one should never have, well, none of them should never have occurred. But that's not too bad, I would think. At any rate, uh, just wanted to share that with you. I uh, want to encourage you to keep an eye out in your organizations and your units and so forth. If you see something that can be improved upon, jump on it jump on it. I always uh, tried to operate under the philosophy of leaving the unit a better place for me having been there. And um, in this case, I, I feel pretty darn good about it. The uh, one last thought with this is uh, we don't ever record the accidents that don't happen. We always record the ones that do happen. But I think the experience speaks for itself. Kind of ran over on this one than I normally like to do. Um, but tell you what, there's just a lot to pack into this. So with that in mind, this is Bobo Base Gear Stop.